Welcome to Sexology, a podcast that untangles the science of sex and pleasure. And now, with this week's episode, your host, clinical psychologist, Dr. Nazanin Moali. Hello there. Welcome to episode 34 of Sexology Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Nazanin Moali. Thank you so much for tuning in. Today is my birthday, and I'm super excited to share my birthday with you guys and celebrate it by uh, recording a podcast. And during the weekend, my sister and I, we went skydiving as a way to celebrate the birthday. It was a fantastic experience. There's something very empowering about facing your fear. A few months ago, I was in Chicago and I went to the Sears building and they have this like glass floor that I'm sure many of you guys probably heard about it or you went there. And I looked down and I saw I was horrified. I never, I didn't know I was scared of height until that moment. So that exact moment I said, I'm going to do skydiving for my birthday. Because to me, it's really important to face the challenges and fear. And there's just something amazing about doing something that you're scared of. So I'll post some uh, pictures in the show notes. And I want to ask from you for a gift. Since it's my birthday, I would love it if you give me gift of honest review on iTunes. I know it takes a couple minutes, but it means a lot to me because I want to make sure that I'll reach a broad audience. I'm very passionate about spreading the sex positive sexual education around the globe because growing up, that wasn't something that was available to me in Iran. And that's why I'm doing this show. And that's why I'm passionate about this topic. Anyhow, today we're going to talk about integration of mind-body when it comes to addressing sexual challenges or when you want to improve your sexual health, why it is important to not only focus on our thoughts, but also tune in to our body. Our guest today is Dr. Janet Brito. Dr. Janet Brito is a licensed clinical psychologist and a licensed clinical social worker in Hawaii. She's an ASAC certified sex therapist and a graduate of the fellowship program in human sexuality at the University of Minnesota Medical School, one of only a few university programs in the world dedicated to sexuality training. Currently, she's the founder of the Center for Sexual and Reproductive Health, where she specializes in the areas of relationship and sex therapy, gender and sexual identity concerns, out of control sexual behavior, non-traditional relationships, holistic sexual health approaches, and infertility. To learn more about her practice, check out her website, sextherapyhawaii.com. Here is my conversation with Dr. Janet Brito. Welcome back to another episode of Sexology Podcast. As I mentioned during the introduction, I'm very excited to have Dr. Janet Brito in our show today. She's a psychologist and a sex therapist, and I'm so excited about our conversation today. Dr. Janet, welcome to our show. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here with you too. Thank you for accepting our invitation. I was sharing with you that like after we talked on the phone, I looked up the some of the presentations you had online, and that was very interesting. Yeah, I, I, I'm very passionate about this topic and this subject and how to incorporate the body into sex therapy because most of my training has been more on CBT and I, I think that's really effective, but the combination of the two of CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy and mind-body approaches really work really well. I am so glad that you're talking about it, you're increasing awareness about this added feature added part of the therapy that can people kind of incorporate because based on my experience, I mean, with sex therapy, obviously it's mostly talk therapy, but I know when it's only we're focusing on thoughts, not paying as much attention to the body, uh, we're not necessarily tapping to all the things that we can use to help people improve their well-being. Absolutely. Exactly. 
So it's just adding another, another help, another way of helping people dealing with sexual concerns to heal, including the body. Yes. And you know, one thing that these days is a buzzword and, but I'm sure many people are now familiar with it. It's a mind body approach since that's area that you extensively use in your practice. So help us understand it more. What is mind body approach? A mind body approach is a way of incorporating the body and helping the body to relax. So it's, it could be either mindfulness, it could be a way of mi- mindful eating, it could be yoga, it could be meditation, it could be qigong. There's many ways and one many modalities to use to help the body to relax in order to be able to be present during sexual experiences, especially for those who are very anxious or are having um, low libido or sexual pain. It can be a, it could be as a as a guide, it like gives you some awareness about what's happening in your body so you can be present in that experience. That is so interesting because I feel that, as I said, when we're focusing only on the one aspect, which is thoughts and cognition, we're kind of losing perspective on other aspects that are important. I know with my clients, when I send them to like dance, movement therapy, different kind of things that kind of help them to be more in tune in their body, it's really helpful. Mm. So I'm a Mm. firm believer of holistic medicine. But when it comes to holistic medicine and alternative medicine, I know people tend to be skeptical. So is there any research that supports the efficacy of this approach for sex therapy? Yeah, good point. I I hear you on that. I know there's a lot of uh, concern about mindfulness with sex therapy and mind-body approaches and their, whether they're evidence-based. And they're, they're, although it's in kind of the baby stages and there's not a lot of research, there are, there are some pilot studies. There is some research out of the University of British Columbia and uh, Canadian psychologist Lori Brado. And a lot of my training came from reading her articles and using her manuals because she really has... Um, has some great results on the efficacy of mindfulness-based interventions. She actually combines the CBT with the mindfulness, and it has really shown to improve in the areas of decreased sexual distress, improve uh, sexual arousal, increase in sexual desire. So it just somehow has, there's no way, I mean, it's hard to really measure these things, but based on her studies, there has been some positive results. It's wonderful to hear. And I know when it comes to grants and fundings for research, sexuality usually doesn't get as much funding as anything else. But I'm glad that you mentioned there have been some studies that they kind of looked into mindfulness and like sex therapy and the positive impact of it. Yeah, actually, in my research, I went to uh, Pacifica Graduate Institute and a lot of the focus is on depth psychology. And they do talk about kind of the the body um, as a way of of healing. And actually, it used to be more research, like Eastern medicine approaches incorporate the mind-body-spirit connection. And I think it was with time that, that the mind and the body got separated as two entities. And so now it's like we're trying to get back to how do we incorporate the body back into healing? Because I think it's really essential. It doesn't have to be two separate things, especially since we're walking around and using our bodies all the time. Why can't we use it to our advantage as giving us clues as to what's happening in and outside of the bedroom? So the research is slowly emerging, and thankfully so, because I think we've really gotten far away and it's gotten too scientific. And the body isn't a machine or a it's not a machine that you can just fix and move parts around. It's an organic being that needs nurturance and support and needs to, people need to be viewed as whole people, not just like parts. Yeah. And that's an excellent point because I feel when it comes to like more traditional kind of therapy, I mean, like more like a medical base, the idea is that you change your thoughts so you can change your body and like emotions around sex and everything. And we kind of sometimes look at our body as our enemy. I want to have right. good relationship. I want to have good sex, but my body, I have this pain or it's not working. Instead of kind of, as you said, tuning into what's going on in my body and using it as a guide, we kind of seeing it as our enemy. 
Exactly. Yeah. So how do we kind of friend our bodies? How do we develop a different relationship? Kind of what are we, what are we telling ourselves? How do we nurture ourselves? Really making, pausing and being in the present moment and developing more awareness about our sensations and how they can really help us toward our goals and help us move forward and just see the problem in a different way. And maybe it doesn't have to be a problem that needs to be necessarily fixed. It can be more of a an acceptance-based approach, like this is my body, I accept it for how it is, and it kind of has a different mind mindset. It's a different way of approaching the concern instead of pathologizing it is more of like, I'm a whole person. And if things are off balance in my life, whether it's at work or with my family or I don't have enough hobbies or my spirituality, all those aspects contribute to this, like my body being off balance or me not feeling too good. And then that could affect what your relationships with your sexual self or with your partner. Right. And I, again, I really enjoy your holistic approach because I feel sometimes people coming for sex therapy and say, oh, this is like, for example, I have erectile dysfunction. I have this specific pain. I just want to focus that on that and resolve it. But sometimes what other, when other stuff is happening around them and outside the bedroom that impacts all of those challenges. Absolutely. And I think sometimes people are relieved to know that it's not just targeting that one specific problem, but that there's other things maybe in your life that are off balance. So it maybe can give them more hope that, oh, actually, if I kind of improve this area and maybe start going to yoga or going on walks or watching what I'm eating or having spending more time with my friends, somehow those other areas in their sexuality become more can become more balanced. So I think a lot of it is also psychoeducation and just teaching I usually teach my patients more about this holistic way of viewing their concern. And then, of course, the, the, sex, the sex education piece on what is happening in your body and when does it happen and how does it get triggered and what do you know about what helps it get better and what makes it worse. So it's really increasing that sexual awareness. But I think to do that, it's the mindfulness is the important piece, really pausing and learning to have a different relationship with your body, tuning in to know what's happening you know, how's your breathing when you're with your partner? Are you, is it shallow breathing? Are you relaxed? Are you pretty tense? So really using the body as a guide to help you with, and, you know, healing yourself. Right. And I'm a big advocate for mindfulness. I see lots of benefits in like overall, my patient's overall well-being when they're doing like practicing mindfulness. So how can, what kind of thing do you recommend your clients to do to increase like being more mindful and what results have you seen when they're more mindful around addressing their sexual challenges? Okay, yeah, excellent point. Thank you. I do a lot of um, education and mindfulness. We could do it together in the room so I could help them. But let's say, let's pause now and let's focus on your breathing now. It's just one, maybe 30 seconds, just on the inhale and the exhale. And I know sometimes it seems strange or people are like, what are we doing? But I'm like, just let's pause for a moment right now and see what's happening in your body. And because a lot of times people are not really in tune with, with what's happening, their, their breath. So, and then we translate that to outside of the therapy room. So when you're driving in your car, usually you go on auto mode. So let's switch that and let's focus on your surroundings and your five, what, use your five senses. What are you observing? What, are, what, are, what is the smell? Um, what are you hearing? So then it's a little bit longer, like a minute, you know, two minutes. When you're at the grocery store, you know, how are, how is your breathing there? So then these little neutral zones and non-threatening environments and you begin to focus on your breathing, then it's like, okay, in the bedroom, when you're with your partner or when you're thinking about sex, let's, let's compare it. Well, how is your breathing then? How are you, um, is it shallow? Is it, you know, slow? So it starts off in the therapy into like real life situations to that more stressful environment, which for some is in, 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 you know, for sex and incorporating that breath work in there. And then it starts to increase from five minutes to 10 minutes to 30 minutes per day. And then really focusing on the sensations in the body, let's say, well, in the shower to a genital 
a mirror exercise. So you're using a mirror to look at your genitals and then just observing, not judging, really being kind and curious and open to seeing what's happening. If I'm looking at my vulva or I'm looking at my penis, how am I feeling? How's my breath? So it's just giving us information. And so once we have that kind of awareness, it can really um, expand the, the sensuality. And then as in addition to really what you're telling yourself. So if you're telling yourself, I'm a sexy being, my body is alive, I'm so sexual, I go with the flow of my sexual energy, while you're being aware and tuning into your body, it can really kind of make a difference because then the feeling will follow. The belief is like, oh, I have this mantra, I have this belief, and then the feeling can follow of like, hey, I'm feeling positive about my sexuality. I want to connect with my partner. So it kind of has a whole kind of um, integrative approach, I guess. Is that No, I love true? it. No, I yeah. think that is just fantastic because sometimes I always give assignment to, our cl- to my clients as well with mindfulness, but I, f- I like that you're adding on like a mirror exercise so they can transition that in a safe environment to kind of introducing it and integrating it to their uh, sex life with their partner as well. But sometimes when it comes to sexuality, I hear because partly because of the messages people got from the society early childhood, when it comes to it, they feel this very intense shame about their body, about being sexual. And that just, that's just so painful for them. They just start checking out. How do you usually approach that? Yeah, that's a really challenge. Sexual shame is so debilitating and it's so, and it's so painful. And I really, I validate and I really acknowledge that it's, it's, it's difficult and it's painful. So baby steps. I'm like, we're just planting seeds and we're in a scavenger hunt. And my hope for you is that one day you will have some self-acceptance about your body and that your relationship to it may change to a more, I'm, I'm introducing you to a more sex positive idea. It may not be the idea, it's just another idea for you. I know it's been more, of, you've had more restrictive views on your sexuality and, and that made sense at the time, but at this point it's, interfering with you in your life and it's just not making you feel good so it's more about like it's just another idea and when you're ready we can move to the next step so I really meet them where they're at I'm, I don't try to be pushy and instill my my views I just provide a lot of education and with time it's like oh oh that that kind of makes that kind of makes sense if I just pause I don't have to do anything I can just be so I'm like, we're detectives here, so we're just kind of exploring. And if you have a lot of judgment coming up, oh, we're noticing that. That That's okay. I don't, ha- it's like a weather system. It's like clouds. We're just noticing them and we're not attaching any negative or positive value to it. It's like, imagine yourself sitting on a bench and you're just watching these thoughts. And it's like, oh, okay, interesting. Thank you. Moving on. So I kind of try to be just gentle and like, just normalize because I know sexual shame can really just debilitate people and it's very hard to to transition from that mindset, especially when you receive those really negative restrictive views on sexuality. And so yeah, I take just kind of take it take it slow and one one minute at a time I go, that's just little, little baby steps. I agree with you because when it comes to the mindfulness, just these exercises can be very challenging to do it. And also because it takes a while for people to see the results. I know sometimes my clients feel discouraged. It's like, oh, I tried five days (laughs) and I didn't (laughs) see any changes. These are the things that works long, long term. And I mean, research shows that it changes your brain chemistry and uh, uh, connections and everything. So (laughs) I love that Yeah, you're talking about like small steps, hopefully long term, (laughs) it will uh, result in changes. Yeah. And then, you know, I then just insert some um, more education, like I may share some of the research from Lori Brado, I may recommend an article just to balance it out. I'm just talking this out of my, you know, just out of the air. It's like this has helped some other women, other people with similar experiences. It may help you if you're open to considering it. Right. So, 
Yeah, a slow, it's a slow process, but I think in the end, from the people that I have seen really immerse themselves in it, have said that it really helps them. It's like, oh, at least I'm just, just I'm, le- I'm less anxious. And I'm like, that's, that's already an accomplished goal to begin with. To be less anxious, that's amazing. Right. And in turn, that impacts people's sexuality, because as you were talking about, it's not this like a separate part of our life. It is part of what's going on, like other things are impacting it. And one thing you were talking about, that was fascinating about the the narratives that are stories. So how do you think our narratives can contribute to our sexual challenges? Yeah, I think that's very powerful, kind of the sexual script that we tell ourselves. And oftentimes I check in on, so where did the script come from? Whose script is this? Is this your script or is this your family's or your religion or the, 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 the neighborhood you grew up in or, you know, our, our Western society? Really kind of checking in. So because the self-narrative can really take a hold of people. So if, especially if it's a uh, very res- restricting and um, there's no room. And so I kind of say a narrative sometimes is like a, one of your favorite coats or a shoe and it doesn't fit anymore. And you're really trying to squeeze into it. You're like, but I really like this. It really made a lot of sense. And now it's not making sense for you anymore. It's like interfering with, you know, being with your partner or, you know, feeling comfortable in your body. So how, how, what can we do to re-narrate this, this story that is your story? What do, what do you want your story to be? How can we create a new, a new beginning, middle and end? How can it have a more self-empowering uh, narrative where you're in control of this story? You get to choose it. You're the author. And so I just try to be very nurturing and very supportive and gentle along the way because I recognize that when it comes to talking about sex and really challenging beliefs, people are very protective. And there's a reason why. I mean, there's a reason why you got to hold on to those beliefs because they're your foundation and they've helped you get to where you are. So definitely, I'm not trying, I'm like, we need to keep them here. I mean, this is what's helping you along the way. But we also want to introduce new ways, especially because of why are you here? And what's your purpose? So if that's your purpose is to enhance and improve your sexual well-being, then this might be a way to kind of help you feel more in control, more imp- more empowered and more comfortable with just being you. Right. And I think one thing you were talking about was beautiful. You're the author of that story because sometimes people come in and see a, they don't, they're not familiar with the, the narrative in their head and how be it's a story and you can change it and modifying it. And I know it's easier said than done because mm-hmm. some of these stories were transferred from generation to generation. So it turns to this mm-hmm. true, but sometimes with the mindfulness practices that you mentioned, I know it helps people to kind of recognize this is, oh, this is the story of good girls don't have sex. And kind of mm-hmm. acknowledging that and saying, as you said, whether it does it, how does it fit in your life right now? Exactly. Kind of checking in. Does it make sense now that good girls don't have sex? Is that really true? Let's, let's talk about that. Can we challenge it? You know, so yeah, I think it's being curious and open and not shaming the person also for those, that story they've had, but really just examining it in a different way. And just being more open and adding more, more chapters, <laughs> adding more, uh, more, more endings to it, Dif- different, different, um, different endings to the story. Absolutely. Yeah. And I'm kind of a big believer of the more we're open about it in a safe environment, like going to sex therapy or talking to a friend that you can really trust, it helps you to kind of feel more comfortable about it. Because when the more we keep this thing as a secret, then the shame part of oh, it, it gets bigger. Exactly. And that's what I, when you, as you were talking, that's what I thought. The secrets and the shame and how secrecy really is the home. Shame and secrecy go together, right? It's like, it's like, it just keeps brewing. The more secret you have, the more shame there is. And then it's just, you're alone by yourself, isolated. And you think you're the only one having this experience. So if you can share your story, it's like, oh, I'm not the only one that's having this experience. It's okay. You're kind of liberating the shame by revealing the secret. 
Absolutely. And I think I wanted to transition to something else is that because we, as we were talking about how you implement alternative medicine in your practice and also the video I share with you that I watched you presenting, I saw <laughs> that you had a number of great recommendations about alternative medicine practices that people, a uh, client can practice in order to enhance their sexual health and intimacy. Oh, that's great. Yeah, I'd love to talk about that. One of my favorites is restorative yoga. And that is, um, I studied under Judith Lasseter, and she's like the goddess of restorative yoga. It's really helpful because it's all about providing comfort. And it, it, it comfort in a dark, because you want to cover your eyes in a dark, relaxed room. And you're doing using a lot of props to support the body. And this promotes relaxation. So if you do it for about 15 to 20 minutes, it triggers our parasympathetic our nervous part of, the, part of our nervous system. So it can really just, just help you to relax. And if you can relax your body, because I tell my clients, sex is all about relaxation. So if you're totally anxious and totally really just judging yourself on how you're performing or whether you're not performing or what, you're not going to be able to relax. So restorative yoga is a way of helping people relax, come into their body. And it's just so, it's so comforting. I do it all the time. 15 minutes, put a whole bunch of pillows and put a little eye pillow. And you're like, oh, this is like Zen, instant Zen. It's, it's magical. You can also do legs up the chair. So you'd put a chair and put your legs, on a, legs up on the chair or legs up the wall. So these are some positions that, uh, yoga positions that are done in a restorative way. So you're not doing like, this is not for core strengthening or, you know, uh, enhanced muscle definition. This is all about relaxing the parasympathetic nervous part of the nervous system. So that's one that I really like and I really believe in. The other one is um, acupressure. So um, I was doing, I, I, I really believe in acupuncture. Acupuncture uses needles to uh, touch on certain meridians of the body to uh, promote healing. And you need somebody to do that for you. But for acupressure, you can do that on, on your own. So this again taps on the certain meridians of the body. So one of them that's known to enhance sexual health and intimacy is by placing your thumb or a middle finger between your eyebrows at the root of your nose. And then you apply just gentle pressure to this acupoint for 10 minutes. And then it just kind of focus on your breathing. And you can also tell yourself an affirmative, uh, positive mantra. You know, like, I'm a, po I'm, a, I'm a sexual being and it's okay to be me. Something like that. You can also do this with your partner. So you both can apply the acupressure points to each other. And really kind of promote that kind of eye gazing, connection, intimate, sensual, uh, pleasure based experience versus like focusing on like, oh, we got to get this right or I need to please you. It is not about that. This is just about focusing on that moment together. And the last one would be probably like my like food is medicine. So really kind of focusing on aware of what you're eating because I do believe that you are what you eat. And definitely if you're eating a lot of junk food, it can affect how you feel. And I know a lot of my patients are like, we just don't feel good. I'm not getting enough exercise. I'm eating, you know, fast food and definitely I'm tired and I don't want to be, I don't feel sexy and I don't want to be sexy. So really kind of, okay, let's get back on here. Some walking, some mindful eating to kind of promote more energy. Yeah, I think were those kind of what you're, maybe I missed some. No, absolutely. I think I love that when you were talking about acupressure. Actually, I like all of them. <laughs> but with the acupressure, I was like, when I saw you presenting on that, I was trying it. I was interesting. That's to see, okay, that's something you can do. And it can be kind of, you can compare it with kind of a positive affirmation you mentioned. So I, I've been practicing it <laughs> since last week to see uh, how is that. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, oh, this feels really nice. I should do this every day. <laughs> right. No, I love that. And I think yoga, just as you mentioned, especially the restorative yoga is really important because I know in this society, all like the, at this time, everyone want to kind of get fitter under a kind of muscle definition, which is okay. But then it's important <laughs> to pay attention, do things to reduce your stress. 
So I think Absolutely. definitely, yeah, the yoga part is important. As far as the food also, I, I like that you were talking about food that can help with like overall imp- improve overall well-being. Is that, and I, you know, it's interesting because sometimes I I hear they say, oh, this this food specifically, it's good for like sexual well-being. Is there any research on that or is it just more about eating like wholesome foods? I think there's some research more on like... Um, Sub- supplements so like let's say ginseng uh-huh. like ginseng can promote like your libido or like uh, foods with vitamin e or su- vitamin e supplements they can also help with improving your um your libido your sex drive so or i think that's maca improves your sex drive and vitamin e is supposed to, it's supposed to help with um improving uh kind of like vaginal health as far as arousal so I don't know much about the particular foods. I know there's like aphrodisiacs. Right, you know, <laughs> I hear about that. Oysters, <laughs> you know, that's supposed to promote, you know, more sexual aliveness. But I would think it's more about wholesome foods because of the way it kind of energizes you. But I don't know what the research is necessarily on. Certain foods promote, you know, better sexual satisfaction but that would be a good study <laughs> <laughs> yeah but that's I, I absolutely on board with you when you talk about that like you know eating wholesome food and food that are good for your body can help your overall health which in turn improve your sexuality and you, because you're feeling better the better you feel better uh like overall health you have and you're hopefully be at least more sexual and alive Right, right. It's that self self nurturance. It's really how you take care of yourself. I think it really impacts on how good you feel about your body, how connected, how like in tuned you are, and then you're going to be more likely to want to share a moment with somebody else. Absolutely. So, Doctor Janet, thank you so much for your time. What are the best ways for our listeners to get a hold of you? Oh, yeah. I'd love for people to visit my website, which is sextherapyhawaii.com. And I also have this amazing Facebook page uh, where I post a lot of related sexual health articles on sex, gender, and reproduction. And so it's very, it could be uplifting. You could be more aware about anything related to sex. So please follow me on Facebook at uh, Dr. Janet Brito and uh, find me on my website at sextherapyhawaii.com. Wonderful. So I'll make sure I leave a link to those information websites and the show notes. And thank you so much for your time. It was absolutely my pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Dr. Brito. I loved her mind-body approach to sexual health and wellness. And I think it's such an important part of treatment is to attend to your body, psychological well-being and mental uh, wellness. Because sometimes based on my experience, when my clients only go to their urologist or gynecologist and try to solve the sexual challenges with a medication, that's oftentimes is a band-aid solution and doesn't address the issue in a meaningful way and oftentimes the challenges resurface anyhow this was our show for today and please don't forget to record your questions in our podcast website so we can feature it and answer it all right i'll talk to you next week thanks for listening to sexology podcast for more great content visit www.sexologypodcast.com Please be advised that information presented on this podcast is not a substitute for seeking help from a licensed mental health provider.